to note the fact that this verse is most likely an, an early Christian hymn that Paul is referencing. Or maybe like a poem, but, but a hymn that encapsulates very briefly and succinctly the hope of the gospel. So follow along as I read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, on this Easter morning, may every person here, every one of us, be counted among those who have believed on Jesus and are in Him forever changed. May every heart here behold him by faith. Behold him in all his resurrection glory. Oh, Father, by the power of your spirit, would you make us to be more like Christ, and to have more of our hope, more of our faith in him and him alone. And if there's anyone here this morning who is not, found their hope and their confidence in Christ. May your spirit so work this morning that they would, their eyes would be open and they would hear his voice and they would come to believe that he is in fact the one who is risen and in him we can rise again. Bless us now we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to begin this morning by returning to words we all sang together early in our service, the third stanza of In Christ Alone, that captured the truth of both Holy Saturday and Easter morning. We sang, There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And he stands in victory. Sin's curse has lost its grip on me. Do you know that hope? I hope you do. That sin and sorrow and all the miseries of this life do not have the, the final grip on you because Jesus stands in victory. Powerful words. Beautifully written. Capturing the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a good hymn does just that, doesn't it? A good hymn encapsulates truth in such a way that we can remember it and, and carry it with us as we sing or as we hum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you can take that with you. In 1 Timothy 3.16, we find a stanza of a much earlier hymn that like in Christ alone, succinctly captures, in a nutshell, a world of truth. Paul, in writing to Timothy about, he's writing about living together as the people of God and the church, the people of the living God, and he offers this stanza of a hymn as capturing the Christian confession. What is our confession together? What he calls the mystery of of godliness. And by that word mystery, he doesn't mean something sort of vague or unclear. By mystery, he means that which once was hidden, now revealed. So the mystery of godliness, the, the, what once was hidden, has now been revealed in these words, in this memorable history of Jesus. I don't want to leave any questions to who the he is. The he in these verses is Jesus. For he himself is the good news. Indeed, he himself is the one we need. Jesus himself is what the world needs. I was 
was thinking about that this week and looking at the when I was looking at the weather and thinking about Easter morning, it's always a gift when the weather turns out nice on Easter morning. We were here early at 15 and the sun was shining. What a gift. Maybe the best beautiful morning of the year so far. Green grass, tulips, the start of spring. So fits the message of resurrection, doesn't it? And yet, I want to say, brothers and sisters, that we need something so much more than a little bit of sunshine, don't we? I think in the popular imagination, sort of in our culture, Easter is sort of the kickoff of summer fun. Oh, don't we need so much more than just a holiday? Don't we need so much more than a, a rain, a sunshine? What we need this Easter morning, what we need every morning is truth and hope and anchor for our souls, a firm place to stand, right? And there's only one firm foundation to build a life on. I mean, we need more than optimism. We need more than wishful thinking. We need more than some hope that there'll be a better president come the end of November. We need more than working for the weekend or vacation in the summer. We, what we need, we need a hope that is grounded in reality that can sustain us and keep us. We need the truth of who Jesus is, what he has done for us, all that he has accomplished in his life, in his death, in his res resurrection, and in the fact that he still lives and is reigning over all things for us. This week I was sobered that, by the thought that this may very well be the last Easter for someone we love. It could be my last Easter yeah. or your last Easter. Don't fool yourself. And so we need a hope that will keep us, a hope that will sustain us, whatever comes. I was reading a little essay this week written by a dear Christian sister. She's writing about her hope, and uh, well, let me just, I'll begin reading. This is written by Barbara Giuliani, the sister of Paul Miller. She wrote, our family has faced other quiet hospital rooms since my father's passing, but none sadder than the room where our 33-year-old 33, 33 son passed away after a short struggle with cancer. Despite our many prayers, Jesus called his name, and he was gone. There were no signs from heaven that day, but how thankful I am for the one sign from heaven that will stand through eternity, Jesus standing in the garden healed and whole, in the flesh, calling Mary's name. That's what John read for us this earlier from John chapter 20. She continues, I know he called our son's name and gave robes to life forever. And I'm waiting to hear him call my name. What a day that will be. That's the hope. That's the hope the world needs. That's what we need this morning and every morning. This solid, ground, firm foundation. This hope. Jesus stood up out of the grave. He was in the garden and he called her name. And he'll call your name if you're taking refuge in him. If you're putting your hope in him. Abandoning all hope in yourself. You can't save yourself. And just throwing yourself on him. All you need is need to know your need and to cast yourself on Christ, on Jesus, who loves weak and needy sinners, who loves to pour out his mercy, who loves to give hope and power to keep going. So let's consider just in this hymn. A few of these truths that ground us, that give shape to, the, to form a lasting hope that we can build our lives upon. And I want to do these six simple lines in this hymn. We'll focus on the first two. 
We'll begin with the first that just tells us he, Jesus, was manifested in the flesh. So much truth packed in those few words. Six in the English, only four in the Greek. Here we are reminded that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, became a man and took on flesh. God with us. This is what we call the incarnation. Not in the least bit ceasing to be God, the Son took to himself a true human body and soul. Paul wrote in Romans 8.3, God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. There was no sin in him, but he was in the likeness as close as he could be, carrying our mortal flesh upon him. He knew no sin, but he was liable to the same sorts of weaknesses we face. The same sorts of temptations we endure. He was subject to weariness and pain and suffering and even death. So Paul wrote, Jesus made himself nothing. He took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He became a servant to conceal his glory and his sins for a time. For a time, right, he, he walked this earth as a, a man of weakness and lowliness. And yet in that concealment, there was also this wonderful self-revelation, right? It was in coming down in this form of a man, taking on the form of a servant, he was revealing himself to be love. It was for love's sake that Jesus came down. And humbling himself and taking on the flesh, we find the infinite, condescending, self-giving love of God. That he was so humble himself for us. God came down into our mess, into our disaster. And he suffered for us. Paul continues in Philippians 2. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on the cross. The death of shame. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, we sang. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath of God was satisfied. Jesus died for me. If your hope is in him, you can say the same. And that's a good short statement of the gospel in part. Jesus died for me. But that's not all the story, is it? Right? There's more to the story than that. Jesus died for me. That's true. And there is gloriously more truth. Jesus rose for me. So that one day I know I will rise forever. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Life-giving hope, again, in very few words, Jesus vindicated by the Spirit of God. What does this mean? You might think about over the course of Jesus' life, how was he vindicated? When, when did the Spirit vindicate him? And, and we might think upon his baptism, when the wisdom and the holiness of Jesus was Vindicated that the Spirit came upon him, and the Father said, I am well pleased. This is my Son. We might think of the ministry of Jesus as he was, his words, his claims were continually vindicated as he healed and restored by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit through his hands and words. But more pointedly, and most importantly, the Holy Spirit vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. Hear this ancient Christian hymn is proclaiming resurrection. Easter is the proclamation and celebration of his vindication. He is risen. His words were true. His claims were true. He is who he says he is. Now think about it. As long as Jesus Stay in the grave. The 
curse of the cross stood over him as a verdict, stood over him as an unchallenged sentence of shame. In the grave, he was condemned and considered cursed and guilty. Or at the very least, there was a question mark hanging. What happened? But all doubt is removed Easter morning. He has risen. He has vindicated. The resurrection was God's amen over the words of Jesus when he said it is finished. <laughs> this is my son. His work is done. Death cannot hold him. He is risen from the grave. And the rest of this early hymn follows from there. He was seen by angels. Right? He was set on the, the, uh, the rock that blocked the tomb. His victory was proclaimed among the nations. He was and is believed upon in the world. He was taken up in glory, and there he lives, the man, Christ Jesus, the God-man, until the day he returns to consummate his kingdom once and for all, when he will come back and make all things right, putting all things under his feet. Peter's first sermon at Pentecost, he declared God raised him up. Oh, Jesus, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Truly, our Lord Jesus stands in victory. Can you connect the dots? The wonderful implications for us who trust in him, who put our hope in him, so we can continue to sing from in Christ alone, since curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, a risen and living one, and he is mine. I'm bought by the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. Gosh, I want to press that home into your hearts and mind, because is that true? Do you believe it? No guilt in life. What, what, what shame are you carrying this morning? Or throughout the week? No fear in death? Do you believe it? Is it possible? It is. Because his vindication was for our justification. His vindication accomplishes everything for us to be called sons and daughters of God, and to be sure that we will live forever, Paul wrote in Romans 4, about the righteousness that will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Romans 4, verse 24. Jesus' vindication was for our justification. He who knew no sin became sin was delivered up on the cross for our trespasses and was raised, declared greater than death, defeated the enemy, sin, and declares us, his children, righteous, justified, counted righteous, simply because we put our faith in him, the one who defeats death. His vindication then becomes the solid ground of our hope. That we are justified, that we're God's children, that we can that, that we can keep going with hope. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And so, brothers and sisters, it is not foolish to believe and trust in this hope that we'll live forever together in Christ in a better world. It's not foolish for these two simple reasons. First, Jesus said so. Let me read to you Jesus' words for us from John 11. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone 
who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus said it, and secondly, he was vindicated by the Spirit, and his resurrection vindicates and validates all the words he said. <laughs> if you could beat death, everything that you said right, is verified to be true and powerful and will be reward. Our hopes in him are justified. Right? His resurrection wasn't simply a resuscitation or any old resurrection, like following the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus' resurrection was the resurrection, the beginning of what the Bible considers the resurrection, the great gathering of all of God's people to live forever. That's why Paul and others call Jesus the first fruits or the firstborn of the new creation, the first fruits of the resurrection. There's one harvest, one crop. Jesus is the first fruit of the harvest. We will be gathered in in the same resurrection in our time when God raises us from the dead, but it's all in one piece. Jesus' resurrection was the beginning. And so one author, John T. Rhodes, wrote, the tomb of Christ was the womb of a whole new world. So when Jesus rose from the dead, new creation exploded into this old, tired, broken down world. When Jesus defeated death, he began a new age. He ushered in a new kingdom. We will rise in him as his own, as his children, because he started the age of the resurrection for all who will believe. Brothers and sisters, that, that begins now spiritually in our hearts, and one day we'll experience it in full bodily. Listen to Ephesians 2. You, you know this passage. It begins, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead in sin before you knew Christ. But something has happened. Paul writes, but God, but God, though you were dead, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. If you put your hope in Christ, you have been raised. You've been made alive. What else does that mean? But your inner man, the, the core of who you are, is resurrected with Christ. There's an instance which you're already in glory. I'm already there. <laughs> Though there's some catch-up work to do in history and for our bodies, when one day our souls new and our bodies new will be joined together and we'll be there body and soul to live forever in a new heaven and a new earth. We read something similarly hopeful in Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Deliver them from slavery. We are raised and delivered. Can't this change our everyday life? To know that the work is done, Jesus is risen, our hope is in him, and he will bring us home. He will bring us into eternal life. And so again, friends, I say to you, it is not foolish to live in this hope. It is not foolish to live for the king who defeated death. It is not foolish to live for the world to come and to put behind you the things of this world that are passing away. It's not foolish to go all in on the promises of Jesus because he is risen. Right? All the marketers, they want you to live for stuff. They want you to keep buying and consuming. 
politicians want you to, they, they want you to be angry about this and that. They want you to be wound up and wound up about the, the things of this world. And here we're invited to something so much greater, so much more wonderful. It is not foolish to live in a holy indifference to the things of this world that are passing away, to follow him in the way of sacrificial love, to, to give yourself away, to lose the things of this world to gain the next. Let me close with that thought and with the final words of In Christ Alone, where we read, There is no guilt in life or fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand because he is with me. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, our hope may be more and more in Jesus.